Psalm 99, the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim, let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion and he is high above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name, for he is holy. Welcome to the Pikes Peak Church of Christ and our midweek Bible study live streaming since everyone is home and can't get out, we pray that this finds you well and healthy and that you're making the most of your time in confinement. We want to continue our study of the Word together, and we are thankful for this technology that allows us to do that. And we hope that it is an enjoyment and an encouragement to you uh, as you join in with us. We want to welcome our Woodland Park brethren uh, who are joining us as well. And for all those maybe who just found us or family and friends from around the country maybe who are joining in, we're glad that you're here. Before Grady begins the class, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for all of the wonderful blessings we have. Father, we know that there's much angst and worry in the world today because of the virus. And Father, we pray that all of us will look to you for the strength and guidance we know that you provide. Father, for our first responders, for our medical personnel who are out and about and taking care of those people who are sick, Watch over and bless them. Keep them healthy. And Father, we thank you for their passion and dedication to service, especially to us in these difficult times. As we begin this study, may it be an encouragement to all of us, and may you be glorified for our activities together. 
And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. And once again, we want to welcome you to our midweek Bible study. No, it's not just the same way that we have gathered together and studied the Bible in our auditorium and others in different classrooms in years past, but we welcome you to this study. And if you were with us last week, you may remember that we began with a study of our awesome God. And there's something in me, there's something in you, there's something in humanity at large. We want to know what's out there. We want to know what will be. We want to know why. We want to know how. We want to know so very much. But there's a yearning and a great need in us. We want to know our Heavenly Father. I'm sure you've heard the stories and followed the stories and years gone by. Maybe it's been your family's experience. There's a child that is adopted. And as the child comes to years, there's a real need to know who the biological parents are. Some of that has to do with health history and all of that. But I think it's instinctive in us. It's innate in us. We want to know. We want to know our Heavenly Father. And in this series of lessons, as long as we'll need to continue this Bible class by YouTube, we want to think a bit about knowing God, who He is, and our desperate need to be found in His presence and to rejoice in His blessings. Now then, last week, here was the slide that we emphasized. And we looked at Moses in Exodus chapter 33. We're not going to cover the same ground again. If you weren't with us last Wednesday night, it's just enough to say that Exodus 32, that's the golden calf chapter. That's when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and found all of Israel dancing and sinning against the Lord God around that golden calf. And the last verse of that chapter tells us that there was a plague that broke out in the camp. The people had brought the wrath of God upon them. And then the opening verses of chapter 33 God told Moses and Israel to go on, go your way, but I'll not be going with you. And that prompted Moses' urgent, desperate cry unto God. And he first off asked God, I need to know your way. I need to know your direction, your instruction. Tell me what to do and how to do it. And then after that, Moses asked for something even greater, more profound, more important. And it's a hard passage to understand, perhaps. But when Moses says, I want you to show me your glory, what Moses was really asking, Oh, Lord God, I need to see you. I need to know you. And all of us have that very desperate need. We want to know God. We need to know God. And there's something within us. We have to know our Heavenly Father. But now then, this week, here's the next step that we're going to take in that progression. I need to know, I want to know, I have to know, and knowing my God, I have to tell others what I have learned, what I have discovered. I have to tell. Look at these verses from Psalm 145. Verse 1, I will extol you, O God, my King. 
And other translations have it, I will praise you, I will exalt you. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. And I will praise your name forever and ever because great is the Lord and great is and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. And the verses 10, 11, 12, and 13, all your work shall praise you, O Lord. And your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And your dominion endures throughout all generations. It's unthinkable. It's unspeakable. It's unimaginable that having come to know God, to learn of His goodness and His grace, and yes, even to gain insight into His righteousness and His judgment to come, how in the world could you and I come upon that wonderful knowledge and understanding and keep it bottled within. You know, there are religions in this world and they're not the least bit evangelistic. Those of you that have gone with me and with Kevin to the land of Israel from time to time, we've eaten at a Druze village D-R-U-Z-E. And that's a group of people, Egyptian origin. They live in the north of Israel and in Syria and in Lebanon and elsewhere. And a very friendly group of people. We enjoy their company and a good meal with them. And I would tell you what they believe. I would tell you something about their faith. But no one knows you're born into that faith community and you die a member of that faith community. They make no converts. And you can go to the most scholarly reference works in all the great libraries of the world and you want to know what Drew's doctrine is and you'll find it nowhere. They don't tell. Well, how different that is from you and from me. We're called upon to share. And we need to declare the glory and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. No, you and I are not a prophet like Jeremiah of old. But when we read what Jeremiah was going through, his disappointment, his heartbreak, when God called him, God told him, I'm going to give you an impossible job. You're going to preach. You're going to teach. You're going to warn. And you're going to devote the rest of your life trying to tell something to a people that will not listen and will not heed. Jeremiah knew discouragement. You'll remember his nickname, the weeping prophet. Well, here's why he was in tears so often. How it was like banging his head against a wall and stubborn Israel would not listen. And Jeremiah said, there were times I said to myself, I'm just not going to, t I'm not going to speak anymore. Nor speak anymore in his name. But then Jeremiah confessed, just as soon as I said that, his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. Not all of us are preachers. Not all of us want to be. 
and of the gifts that our Lord God has blessed us with. You may honestly assess your own gifts and a public oration may be like Moses and protest. I'm not an eloquent man or woman or boy or girl. And hardly any of us are in a position to command attention from hundreds or even tens or even a handful of folk. And so we're not the great mouthpiece, the great prophet, the great spokesman. We're not prophets and apostles. And yet from the youngest to the oldest, from the least to the greatest, however we measure greatness in the kingdom of God, we do that through service, don't we? And having a servant's heart. But for every single one of us, there needs to be this compelling need, this irresistible urge. Let me tell you about my God. Let me tell you what he has shared with us in his word. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you what a difference it has made in my life. And I'm persuaded it could make just as great a difference in your life as well. Our faith is a telling faith. It's a sharing faith. It's a confessing faith. It's a proclaiming faith. And like Jeremiah of old, whenever we close our lips and seal our tongue, whenever we refuse to share with others and declare the majesty of God's revelation, it ought to be within us like that burning fire, fire in our bones, and we simply must declare the glory and the wisdom of Almighty God. You know, the gospel, that means good news, doesn't it? And news isn't news unless it's broadcast. Oh, our faith is not something to be kept inside a church building. Right now, that's not so much an issue, is it? We don't have a museum kind of faith. We don't have something that is secret and hidden. Instead, we have a faith that we long and we love to declare. We want to share the good news with others. Just a couple of illustrations this evening. Notice Acts chapter 14 and Acts chapter 17, and the Apostle Paul, both times, is front and center. Acts 14 with his friend Barnabas, Acts chapter 17, when he's all alone, all alone. Lystra was a Roman colony in what you and I would call modern day Turkey. It was settled by Augustus. And retirees from the Roman legions were placed there. And that's the background of the city. Today it's an abandoned hilltop, and they tell me that that tail has not been excavated. Lystra has long ago perished from the consciousness of the world. But in Acts chapter 14, we read how that Paul and Barnabas entered into that city. And what an amazing scene took place. Acts chapter 14, we read how that whenever they came into the city, there was a great miracle that the apostle Paul did. And he told a lame man to stand up on your feet. And the man sprang up and began walking. And the news spread like wildfire. 
and the most surprising development. We read in Acts chapter 14 how that the people all came together, they lifted up their voice, and they said, The gods have come down among us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And if you'll remember your Greek mythology, uh, there would be Hermes. The Romans called him Mercury. You've seen the FTD florist advertisement with the figure with the wings on his feet, and he would speed to deliver the messenger, the, the message of the God. Because Paul apparently was the chief spokesman, the called him by the name of that God. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd saying, and here I would begin a paraphrase, don't do this. We're men just like you. Let us tell you about the real God, the true God, the living God. You know, the more we might think on that, the more we might appreciate the faith and the courage and the devotion and the piety of Paul and Barnabas to be received as gods. That's better than the key to the city. There was no gift. There was nothing that the people of Lystra would have withheld from these two newcomers. And they were to be worshipped and adored. But Paul said, not so. Can we tell you about the real God? Paul says, you've worshipped idols, you've worshipped vain things. And let's tell you about the God who has not left himself without witness He did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Let me tell you about the God who is going to be good to you and the God who is going to give you gifts and blessings beyond your wildest imagination. Let me tell you about my God. And the same story is repeated there in Acts chapter 17, isn't it? You'll remember that Paul came to Athens and received a signal honor. That traveling, itinerant preacher invited to address the scholars on the Areopagus or Mars Hill. And they gave him a respectful, dignified listening. And Paul was able to share with them whatever it was that he came into their city bearing that brand new message. And you'll remember how that Paul says, I've seen your devotion on every hand. Temples, shrines, altars. Athens had that in abundance. And then Paul says, let me tell you about the God. He doesn't live in a house made with hands. He is made of one blood, all people who live on the face of the earth. And let me tell you about the God who is ever near, that we might seek after him. You know, one of the most striking proofs of the genuineness, of the truthfulness of the Christian faith, has to be the selfless sacrifice of men like Paul and his friend Barnabas, Acts 14 and Acts chapter 17. 
They could have lived royally the rest of their lives in Lystra. Paul could have astounded the scholars in Athens with his learning and his education. But instead, here was the message that burned within that they had to declare. Let me tell you about the God, the God that I know. Well, that should be you and me. That should be us all. Jesus gave a great commission and marching orders, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Psalm 96 was written hundreds of years before our Lord came to this earth. But in a way, I think it looks forward. It's a predictive poem that looks forward to the new age of the Messiah. And here's the resolve of God's people as voiced by the psalmist, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations and his wonders among all people. Our awesome God. If, say tomorrow, the news were to come out that there is a vaccine for this terrible virus that's running through our nation, and Suppose for a moment the messenger said, you know, we came upon this vaccine about 10 days ago. But we're just now telling you about it. Can you imagine the fit? Can you imagine the riot that would break out? People have been dying in these last 10 days or so. How dare you sit on such wonderful news? Well, we've got something better than a vaccination. We've got something better than any cure for any physical malady. Our understanding of the God who made us all and the God who is ever near us and the God who longs that all men should come to repentance and all should drink of the fountain of salvation. The psalmist had it right. This is a new song. Uh, that's not so much the message of the Old Testament. That's not found in the law of Moses. That came about with the coming of a Savior into the world, a Savior that can give sinners salvation and liberty from their sin. A new and glorious song, and I will sing it at the top of my lungs because I can't help do anything but. Nor can you. And that's the urgency. That's the need. It comes from knowing our God. Let's have a moment of prayer together. And then after this, we have a few announcements to share with you. Our dear Father, it is always our joy to devote just a few moments to the study of thy word. It is truly a Light unto our pathway, it's a lamp that we might know how we ought to walk. And dear Father, as we learn more and more about thy divine nature and the hope and the light that it brings to a dark and sinful world, May we not sit on that knowledge. May we not harbor in our hearts. 
But may we, like Jeremiah of old, have that burning fire, that compulsion, that we might declare the saving grace of our Father in heaven, the Son that came to die for us, and the Spirit who has spread abroad and declared and revealed this wonderful message of grace. And in the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let me encourage you and me and all of us to keep on, keeping on, check in and check on one another. You know, it's different now and a bit harder. A lot of us, we were accustomed to showing up early and staying late when we were meeting at the building. And it was a genuine delight to share stories and fellowship with our brothers and sisters, our family members. We can still do that. We just need to go about it in a different way. Call the church office if you have a prayer request, some news to pass along. Or maybe there's a need that we can help you fill. There at the building, we have communion supplies. And we also have envelopes with a stamp on it. Address to the church. And you can pick those up and use those for your weekly contribution. And we also have in the works some other online giving options and we hope to share those details with you so very soon. And all of this is important, it's vital, as the family of God during these troubling times. And we also want to keep in mind our frontline people, our first responders. We have a number in our congregation and they're nurses, they work in assisted living, they are on the front lines as first responders, and again, I hate that I might miss a name. If I do, please remind me and let me add them to this list, but there's Tabitha Heinecker, Jessica Marshall, Lindsay McClure, Megan Conway, Sharice Overstreet, Understanding is that our new brother, Joe Costello, who was to be deployed to New York, that's hit a bit of a wrinkle and his orders have been tweaked a bit. My understanding now is that he will leave soon for Seattle and we want to remember his family as well. Allison, the daughter of Terry McConkey up at Woodland Park. She's working now in the ICU at Greeley, and that's a change from her administrative post because of the crisis that we're going through, and that, of course, carries with it more significant exposure and the possibility of those things happening and uh, we want to pray right along with the Makakis that it will be safe with her. And then there's Alex Ballard and Tim Turley and Heath Neiman. And because of their jobs, they too are mixing and mingling with the public. And as our first responders, we want to lift them up in prayer as well. We don't have a whole lot of updates on our sick want to remember Ernestine Jackson and her friends and family members that have contracted the virus, and we want to keep them in our prayers as well. Marcel Quick's brother, Randy, recently had a CT scan, and that's not looking so good. And we want to remember him and keep him in our prayers as well. And I'm sure that all of us are aware of the news that came down officially yesterday. The grim 
expectation of the number of new exposures, new cases of the virus, and perhaps a soaring death total. And we've been asked in the strongest way possible to maintain our social distancing and not to meet at our building as we love to do. And the things that we're doing now to continue that until April the 30th. So this is a hard time for all of us. And if you need a home delivery, if you need someone on the other end of the phone to talk to and talk with, if there's anything at all that we can possibly do for you, I hope that you will not hesitate to let us all know. Now then, this coming Sunday morning, it's the first Sunday in the month of April, and Kevin and I, we're trying to hold on to our usual schedule course that's changed a good bit but the first Sunday morning in the month that's the time that we all look forward to Kevin's presentation and we'll all want to tune in the YouTube stream then and participate in our worship together and Bible classes Kevin is teaching a Bible class at 9 30 and there are online Bible classes for the younger children and the older children and the teenagers as well. And these are being streamed on different platforms, maybe Facebook Live, YouTube, Zoom, some other tools. And if you have someone in that age group and you really want to know more details, how you can participate, how your kids can participate. Once again, please let us know and we'll get that information to you just as soon as we can. Until the next time, Sunday morning, Lord willing, may the Lord bless you and keep you.